Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Studio 78 Podcast. I am your host, Nishe from NisheSnow.com. Welcome. All right, folks. So it's so crazy. I had a birthday last week. And of course, because of good old COVID-19, I probably celebrated it virtually somehow. And I say probably because I'm recording this intro the Saturday before my birthday, which is on the 31st. So I tell you this coronavirus, COVID-19, whatever you want to call it, has just impacted all of the things. And it really has impacted my guests. Of course, I interviewed her at the beginning of this year before COVID-19. And her name's Sarah McNeely. She's from Constellation and Company, and she owns a letterpress greeting card. So she sells sells cards online, but she also has a brick and mortar. She has a book. She has a um, snail mail club. I mean, she has all the things. So hence why I, (laughs) part of the title for this episode is how to diversify your letterpress business because she just doesn't have one stream of income. But what's interesting is, of course, since she has a brick and mortar, this coronavirus has really impacted a part of her business. We don't, of course, get into it because I've recorded this earlier, but if you follow her online, she has taken all of her things from the store and moved it into her house. I think I saw like a story about that about a week or two ago. And I'm like, oh my goodness, that's thousands of cards. I can't even imagine how long that took. But anywho, I just think that represents how well she's able to pivot in her business and figure out what she needs to do in order to stay afloat. And that is definitely reflected in the interview that you will listen to today. And so in this episode, we talk about all the things, how she got started, uh, how she prepared for the National Stationery Show, um, why she started a wholesale line, why she wrote the Snail Mail Superstar book, why she has like the club, like all of the things. But also what I really love too is just our conversation about the importance of snail mail. And you guys know I love snail mail, which is why sometimes in my newsletter, I write next at the bottom, I have like a PO box address and I'm like, send me a letter, please send me something, send me something because I love getting stuff in the mail, but it's just really good for mental health also. And she talks a little bit about that. And that's one of the the reasons why she actually wrote the book. And so it just got me thinking that as we're dealing with COVID-19 and we're staying in the house, you know, that is that's, you know, really impacting people, especially people who might have depression or people who are already going through health issues to be like quarantined in the house is is rough. So if you can, you know, as you go to, you know, make your, as you make your grocery store run, maybe just throw something like a card in the mail, you know, um, buy some amazing cards from vendors like Constellation Co. And just send your family and friends just a little note to let them know you're thinking about them. Um, I think, you know, the, the post office should still be open. It was at least open today. So uh, things can change. But, uh, you know, send someone a little letter and just let them know that that you care. Anyway, this episode is amazing. Of course, to support the podcast, please rate the podcast five stars on Apple Podcasts. It really helps. If you're listening on YouTube, please give me a thumbs up and subscribe. And yeah, and don't forget to get two months free on Skillshare and check out my course, How to Organize Your Life to Make Time for Your Passion at nishaysnow.com slash Skillshare. All right, let's get to this episode. Hello, Sarah. Welcome to the podcast. Hello. Good morning. 
Morning. Um, can't wait to dig into like all that you do today. But um, just to give the listeners a little backstory, can you tell them a little bit about your story before Constellation? Yes. Yes, I definitely can. So I grew up in Florida in the the hot, muggy South (laughs) and um, went to college at the Ringling School of Art and Design in Sarasota and studied graphic design and then met my future husband. And we drove cross country to Seattle and tried to start a career in the middle of the recession, which is always an adventure (laughs) (laughs) and worked a lot of odd jobs and worked retail and was a, was a temp worker for a while and basically started my business while trying to tread water and make ends meet in a new city. And mm. then started Constellation pretty pretty shortly after I, I got out of college. And it has had a lot of twists and turns and pivots along the way. Um, but it got started pretty quickly because I didn't have very many other options. Yeah. I like to call it my beautiful plan B. <laughs> right. Well, question, because sometimes... Um you know, when I'm, you know, think of the listeners, you know, I know some of them might be in the same place you were right out of college. Mm -hmm. So how did, you know, Constellation start for you? Like, you know, did you have like a very specific vision or were you like, oh, let me just do like some designs here and there just to make ends meet? But what what did that beginning look like for you? Yeah, I have always loved writing letters and sending cards. It's a big part of how I grew up and something that my grandmother and I did send each other letters. And so when I got out of school, um, gosh, I just was bored. I, I don't rest well. I don't take time off well. And I've always been like that. So mm. looking for a job and applying and, and interviewing, I just wanted to make some stuff. Mm. And I was planning my own wedding that, that summer and, um, just, started putting a few things together. And that's when Etsy was still pretty young. I think that was, I think I started my Etsy store in 2008. So Mm. Etsy was still pretty, pretty early. And so I started an Etsy shop and threw things, a few things on there and got really excited about that, that feeling of someone buying something that I made. (laughs) And that sort of snowballed a little bit where I was like, okay, well, if somebody's going to buy something, then I have to make something else. (laughs) Right, (laughs) right. (laughs) Super small and everything was really disjointed. The designs didn't fit together. Um, Mm. And basically during that season got my worst, my very worst first job. (laughs) <laughs> Probably there's the worst job I'll ever have and was just miserable. So I came home every night and needed to have some kind of outlet for making something. And when I quit that job, I uh, had been taking a letterpress class at a local like trade school mm. and basically spammed the inboxes of every letterpress printer <laughs> within the state. <laughs> I was like, please just let me come hang out with you. I'll sweep your floors. I'll do anything. I'll work for free. Just let me come. Um, Cause I knew I wanted to work with my hands and I had this, this love for, from old machinery and this interest in letterpress. And at that point quit my job and spent a full year apprenticing with a local printer to learn the craft of letterpress. So through Mm. that kind of had the opportunity to start taking on clients for wedding invitations because there's a certain time of your life where everyone, you know, gets married. And that was that time for (laughs) me. (laughs) So I had a lot of friends getting married. So I basically, my first few clients did the work for free just to build a portfolio and, um, grew from there. Mm, no, and and that's good to hear too, because, it, and correct me if I'm wrong, but what helped you, it sounds like what helped you have maybe the freedom to do that was because uh, you were living with your fiance and I'm yes. assuming he was working. So if you weren't making a lot or even any money, yes. <laughs> you guys could kind of like live poor. Absolutely. Know, for a while. And I okay. recognize the incredible privilege it is to be buddied up and to have somebody who's willing to you know, keep buying pizza <laughs> while right. you start a business. Right. I absolutely would not be where I am without, you know, his his support and his willingness to uh to let me have this great adventure. Um because a, a lot of it along the way there've been a lot of forks in the road where like when we adopted our son, I knew I wasn't gonna be able to work full time because I wanted to be home with him while he was young. And so we basically 
took all the money I'd been making and funneled it into hiring a team so that the business could Mm. continue to grow while I was home with my son. So yeah, absolutely incredible privilege to, to have somebody willing to, to help out in that way. That's, it's huge. No, I love that. And then, you know, for those of you out there too, who might not have like a significant other, you've heard other people on the podcast who will go back home to live with their parents. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like a sacrifice they're willing to make in order to like, you know, find that job Absolutely. that really gives them happiness. Yeah. And I think it's so <laughs> important to recognize that starting a business requires sacrifice of some sort and that, you know, there's there's different ways to do that. I've, you know, have friends that have taken on funding. So a loan to start, and that's a sacrifice and knowing that all your money's going to go back to that for a long time, or, yeah. um, there, there's a lot of ways to do it. I have friends who worked on their business as a side gig for, you know, a decade while they worked their full-time job to get it to where they wanted it to be, to, to yeah. quit and to, to do the next thing. So, yeah, I think there's a, there's totally a myth of this like idyllic world that small business owners and, you know, bosses live in and, and that world is just does not exist. There's, right. there's hard stuff, no matter how you do it, there's a lot of sacrifice involved. Oh no, I love that. And then, so you're, you know, for a year, you're apprentice, you know, you're doing, you know, like wedding invitations and anything that you can letterpress. I, I assume like you just fell in love with it and was like, whatever I can make, I can make, oh, yeah. I'm going to make. Yes, absolutely. (laughs) And so how did that then um, like turn into a business? Like how long did you stay with that particular letterpress? And then how did you really start to formulate like, okay, I want to focus on, you know, greeting cards versus wedding invitations or X versus Y? Yeah, it felt like an eternity. And now looking back, I realize how short of a period of time it was. <laughs> um, but I bought my first printing press in 2011. And then by 2013, I was so burnt out on weddings that I had to make a shift. Mm, and mm. Um, there's so many parts of it that I enjoyed. But being a purely service-based business, there's really only so many hours in the day that you can work and so many clients you can take on at a time. And I just, I I got so overwhelmed and tired and basically just wanted to find some way for my business to be able to have some more passive income. So Mm -hmm. at that point, I put together my first wholesale greeting card line and took a workshop called um, Paper Camp. It's put on Mm -hmm. by... um, by a lady whose business is called proof to product. And that helped me a ton Mm -hmm. because basically I was starting in a whole, basically starting a whole new business going from service to a product based business and going to be, you know, servicing an entire different customer base. And that helped me with the knowledge that I needed to to start that in at least some kind of a smart way. (laughs) Yeah. Um, And then I launched my wholesale line at the national stationery show in Mm -hmm. 2014. No, that's good stuff. And, you know, I've heard about the paper cam before. So anybody who's listening that's interested, I'll make sure to put in the show notes because I want to say I've heard her on like a couple of podcasts too. And it seems yeah. like people like love her. In yeah, that oh, program. Katie's been a mentor and a friend to me since yeah. 2013. And I've, I'm in a mastermind group um, that she runs now. And I just, I so appreciate how she basically set aside her own business in this industry to just invest in other business owners and help, help them get to where they want to go. I'm pretty impressed with that. Yeah. And then, um, before I, you know, I definitely want to dig into like how you prep for the stationary store, uh, show, because I know that's like a whole like thing, (laughs) (laughs) but but one of the, um, I recently sent an, um, email out to my newsletter list. And I was like, Hey, you know, let me know what you guys are like struggling with right now. So I can make sure to ask my guests some of the questions that pertain to your issues. And one of the things, um, someone wrote back was like staying motivated. Mm -hmm. So to me, like during, you know, this, before you began to get like momentum, like how are you able to stay like motivated and focused? Yeah. Um, for me, I think every time I raise the stakes in my business, that's definitely a big motivator. So if I hire someone, I know I need to be working even harder and bringing in, you know, more business and, and growing the business so that I can keep 
covering their paycheck. That's a big motivator <laughs> for me. Um, and things like the stationery show are also big motivators. Getting a deadline on the calendar that's set in stone. I know I need to have things ready by then. That really helps me kind of work back and set a schedule to keep focused. Um, and then since my son was born in January 2015, That's been a huge motivator for me because if I want to spend time with him on the weekends and the evenings, I know I have to get as efficient as possible during my working hours so that I can have that fun time and and be disconnected. So that's Mm -hmm. that's helped me. I, I, I feel like my challenge is typically getting motivated to take time off to rest, to take care of my body, (laughs) (laughs) to like refresh my mind. Um, That's what I struggle with a whole lot more. And in fact, right now I'm, I'm dealing with a a pinched nerve issue that's affecting like half my body. And yeah, that's been a huge motivator to like make different choices and try to simplify things and um, get my body back on track. Cause there's nothing that makes you humbled like (laughs) your body deciding it's time to stop yeah and and you only have one body right like it's like you don't want to mess that up I know I keep I have all these thoughts in my head where I'm like I can delegate so many things but I can't delegate like eating and no you know (laughs) washing my hair no one can do that for me I need to do that (laughs) right Yikes. Yeah, I've had a pinch nerve before. Like that is the worst. So I can't even imagine it. Like you know, throughout like even one half of like your body, that has to be excruciating. So yeah, definitely rest, rest. rest. <laughs> so for the um, national stationery show, so you know, I've like heard you know, um, you I've read articles on it and and uh, listened to podcast episodes on it. Even though it's so weird because I'm like I don't sell stationery, but it's still. <laughs> It's like fascinating to just listen to like how people, you know, just prep for things like that, because I feel like you could learn like um, production and process skills when you hear other people in different industries. So how did you prep for your first show? Like what worked and what didn't work? Yeah. My first show, I was in a group booth with ladies of letterpress. So that was really helpful because it wasn't just me. So a lot of things had been decided for me, like how much space and what kind of walls and a lot of things, um, deadlines and things. So that was helpful to have a community to start with. Um, and then two years later in 2016, I did the, um, I did my own booth and that took a lot more finesse. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And a lot of the things that I've realized in along the way is that my business has to run differently than other people's businesses. Mm -hmm. And basically my framework and my brand and and all of it are different than how other people do things. And that's, um, that's okay. That's a strength in a lot of ways. So with, with that in mind, I knew I didn't want to do things like build my own hard walls. So the stationary show is this unique beast where the booth itself, there's a really high bar. So people mm. build these, these like hard walls with like baseboards and wallpaper and they make it like its own little like 10 by 10 room. And some of them are beautifully appointed and yeah. just like so extravagant and incredible. And so when I would walk the show, I would look at that and go like, how am I ever going <laughs> to accomplish that? Right. And, you know, some of it is that a lot of folks who do the, the, the shows in New York consistently live in that region. <laughs> so mm-hmm. that's part of it, that they can drive things in or store things in the area. But I'm coming from Seattle. So I had a whole different set of, oh, yeah. of needs and of, of requirements. Um, stuff had to be able to to get there without it being extraordinarily expensive. So I ended up hiring someone to build a, um, a framework out of metal pipes that could all break down into basically like a huge duffel bag so that I could Ooh. check it on the plane and bring it with me. Yeah. And, um, and then I worked with the big canvas drop cloths and my dad and I spent several days grommeting the drop cloths, <laughs> painting them. And so everything could fit basically into several really large suitcases. Mm. Um, so my booth had to be able to, <laughs> to get on, you know, American <laughs> airlines with me. Right. Um, so that was helpful in knowing, knowing what my, my, my goals and knowing what my, uh, framework was as well. Like what, what could I accomplish with, um, 
with, with my set of, of information. Um, so I think that that was helpful for me, but I also walked away from that show knowing that trade shows might not be for my business. <laughs> mm, <laughs> you know, they're mm, always a great experience. Mm-hmm. There's always a lot of great opportunities that come from them. But as far as sales go, I've recognized that the amount of money and time it takes to prepare for a trade show cross country yeah. is not a great use of my time and resources. So I probably will not be doing a New York trade show again, um, just because there's so much more I can be doing with that money and time staying over here in my side of the world. <laughs> no, that makes sense. Cause you know, yeah. you, you do the cost analysis, right. And if it's mm-hmm. like, man, it's not, it's not really bring, bringing in that much more income, then why go through all the trouble to do it? Yeah. yeah. It, I, I've come a long way with things where I've, I've recognized that just because the choice that I made in the past didn't work out the way I desired to keep moving forward doesn't mean it was a bad choice. And right. if I had done the show twice, I wouldn't know that my time and money is best spent elsewhere. Um, and we're also in an industry that is changing drastically. And if you just kind of take the temperature of it, like Hallmark just cut back their greeting card line, their whole division by a ton. Papyrus mm. just um, claimed bankruptcy and closed oh, all their yeah. stores. Yeah. And just looking at, at brick and mortar retail in general, the industry is shifting and um, there's a, a different relationship with sales reps than there used to be. And um, people are wanting to buy on fair versus maybe spending their own money, you know, shop owners spending their own money to go to a trade show and take that time out of their day. So things are just shifting. And mm. I think every industry has those periods of time where everything changes and it can be scary and nerve wracking and confusing, not knowing exactly where to head and knowing that everyone's making different choices. But I think it's, it's good to recognize again, that, that your business is really unique to you and your family and your desires and your, you know, your personality and, and tailoring it the best that you can to you versus looking at what everyone else is doing is just Mm -hmm. so important. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I mean, and for you, like, where do you think the industry is going? So maybe that's like a natural segue too into um, snail mail superstar. Yes. (laughs) Because it's weird, like for me, but I don't know if maybe I'm like the minority because I love like things that are tangible versus like always having something online. Like I would never send somebody an online greeting card. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, no. I'm with this you. <laughs> is right. And so for you, like when you're looking ahead, like we're now in this new decade, right? Where do you see it going? Because I feel like I don't I don't think it's it's dying. I just think it's shifting. I don't know exactly yes. how it's shifting. So I would love to get like your take on that. I absolutely agree. And what I've seen, and again, my business is different, but what I've seen is when I build community around the things that I love, people flock to that Mm -hmm. versus when I've been working in the past with reps or with trade shows, I'm two or three steps apart from my end customer and they may never know me or connect with me. And through my YouTube channel and writing my first book and social media and all of those things, there are ways that I can personally connect with the people who are buying my product, my cards. And that has changed everything, just changed the game for me. And I, I am lucky enough to receive a lot of actual snail mail from my, (laughs) my pen pals, my customers, my friends. And the more vulnerable I've been able to be in connecting with people and being honest about my experiences with grief and, and infertility and adoption and um, just all of these struggles of life and, and, and things that are that maybe that feel really vulnerable to share. The more mm-hmm. vulnerable I've been, the more I've been able to connect with a real person on the other end of it, and the 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 stronger my business has grown. So I think that's some of it that that people want to connect with other real people and. And they want to do that in a real way. And so instead of, you know, maybe going to like a papyrus store and picking up a card right. and liking the design that's, you know, so many steps away from where the actual designer lives and what their personality is and why they do what <laughs> they do, people are able to connect directly with designers and with brands and um, and and to really dig in and, and support with their dollars people that they 
really appreciate. And, and I think that's a positive thing in the end. I really do. Yeah, I I do too, because when people feel connected, then they want to then support that business, that person, because it, it has more meaning. And I feel like we're we're just in a place where people are like, I want more meaning in my lives and I want my dollars to go to something that isn't, you know, from just like any big box store, or so, you know, or this random person, I don't know, or, you know, they, they wanted to have like some, something special to go along with it, like story Absolutely. or what have you. Yeah. Absolutely. I very much agree with that. So yeah, so you can, can you just tell the listeners about kind of like snail mail superstar, like the book and kind of like, kind of what you're doing to you, like bring back snail mail. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, like I said earlier, snail mail has always been a part of my life and something that I've enjoyed and a way for me to connect with the people that I love. And when I started my business, that was on my mind, but the in the 10 years that I've been running my business, it's become more and more important to me to inspire other people to have real conversations with the people in their life, to get past the like deepest sympathies card that they might right. pick up at the, at the, uh, the drugstore and to, to say real things. And that's what my cards have set out to do is to have real conversations, to, to give real words of comfort and support. And through that, I've tried my best to, like I said, be vulnerable and share my life and share the difficult conversations that I'm having and the things that I'm thinking about and basically frame all of that within writing letters and sending snail mail. And so I do a lot of really goofy things on the internet. <laughs> like I've, you know, when it snowed last year, I made a giant snow snail in my yard and then read all my <laughs> mail next to it. Like I do really goofy things, but the, the, the backbone of all of it is, is just to connect with people and to show them that by sending even a single letter, a single letter a year, they can really improve someone else's life and, and c deepen their connections and share love in a, in a real way. Mm -hmm. And, um, I get letters all the time from people where they're like, this is my first letter. I've never sent a letter before. I'm, you know, <laughs> I'm 40 and I've just never done it. Or, you know, college students and teenagers saying like, I was never, I was never raised to send snail mail. It was a thing we didn't do, but I, you know, through finding you on YouTube and, and watching your excitement for it, I really want to send letters. And it's just, it's, it's exciting and inspiring for me to keep going in my business and things that I love when I see other people get excited with me. I just, I, I just love that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I love what you're doing because I'm like, you know, I'm like, Maybe my, you know, in my generation, we used to have like pen pals. Like you would like yeah. look at the back of like Write Magazine and there was like all these other magazines and you would like literally like start emailing random strangers across <laughs> the world or the U.S. Yeah. and just have like letters. And I remember having like a couple of different pen pals and it was always like exciting getting something in the mail and finding out about someone. And I feel like... Um, you know, as, you know, cell phones became more popular and the internet became more popular, that kind of like died out a little bit and you, you lose that, that connection, um, that you have with people, you know, it's not Absolutely. as genuine. It's weird. It's, it's where it's different rather. Yeah, it is. And I, and I think snail mail can be as much of an asset for the person writing it as for the person receiving it. Cause yeah. I know when I sit down with a piece of paper and a pen in my hand and try to gather my thoughts about what I want to say, that's a moment of rest and reflection that I don't get in my life very often. Yeah. And, you know, I try to do journaling. I have a nature journal and I like to draw and all these things, but those feel like, those feel luxurious in some right. ways. <laughs> but sitting down to write someone a letter, it's not just about me. <laughs> so yeah. it's really nice to be able to, to know that this moment of peace for me in my life is also benefiting someone else. And, you know, I, I don't sit down with my phone and, and, you know, tap the text message thing and gather my thoughts and tell yeah, someone right. how they've impacted <laughs> my life and how I feel about them. Like, that's not, I don't do that on email. I don't do that on text. I don't really talk on the phone that much, but in a letter, <laughs> that's the point for me is, is to encourage my friends to, to tell them that I love them and to, to 
tell them what I love about them and, and just to have that, that real human connection. Um, and with my, with my book, I, I set out to write a book about just snail mail, like purely snail mail. And I ended up writing a book primarily about grief because Mm. what I've realized is, is the times that I've been grieving in my life have been when I needed snail mail the most and when I needed mm-hmm. those real connections and that those the moments of reflection even more. So ended up writing, writing a whole book about the intersection of snail mail and grief and um, have just loved since the book came out connecting with, with other people after they've read it and hearing their thoughts and how it impacted them. It's just that that connection continues and I, I love that. Yeah, I agree. Cause I think sometimes people only connect snail mail with the holidays, right? Like, you know, Christmas or whatever, but it's like, if somebody is, you know, suffering from depression or infertility or, you know, anything that is a challenge in their life, like sometimes just getting a letter from someone who cares, um, means the world, right? I mean, Absolutely. yes, you could do a phone call too, but sometimes I feel like, when people are going through those types of um, challenges, sometimes they don't even really want to talk, but just mm-hmm. by them opening the mail, they know like, okay, this person is thinking of me and they took time out to do a card that they felt would touch me and write words, you know, even if they're just a few words to kind of help me during that time. And, and people tend to like hold on to those type of things and yes. really cherish them, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I always encourage people, if you're starting out in snail mail and you don't send anything, don't send birthday cards and Christmas cards. Like, just skip that. Like, because you're going to get overwhelmed and you know too many people with birthdays and you're going to forget. So don't do it. Just send, like, if someone's on your mind, jot down a few things in a card and send it to them and start there. Because I will tell you, I love birthday cards and of course I love my birthday, but (laughs) it's stuff that comes on a random Tuesday when it's been pouring rain and my dog like crapped on the rug and everything's the worst. (laughs) Like that's when I really appreciate receiving like words of love, you know, that, that when you don't expect it. Yeah. And that might too be a natural segue. Like, um, I know I saw on your, your website that you have a card club. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> so like just a couple of questions. Like, so when in your business did you say like, hmm, um, a car club might be a kind of a great way to kind of, you know, keep customers coming back maybe monthly or quarterly or what have you. And um, yeah. W- and why did you start it? What kind of, you know, cards do you include, you know, when you send out? But yeah, can you just talk to the listeners a little bit more about that? Absolutely. It was actually something that one of my customers suggested and asked me for. And I was oh. like, well, I, I, I guess I can't say no to that. I think that's <laughs> right. a good thing. Um, but basically, I, I have a lot of customers that aren't necessarily diehard snail mail people. I have a lot of folks that that recognize what I'm trying to do and appreciate it and want to be a part of it, but aren't dug into the lifestyle of sending snail mail all the time. So mm. really – They love receiving the bundle of, you know, three cards every month and they can then receive it and and send them back out. And it's not that huge of a difficulty. They don't have to really shift everything in their life to to do that. Mm -hmm. And for me, I love curating. It's um, we have two tiers, three cards or six cards. And only a few people want to receive six cards a month because it's a lot. (laughs) Um, But I love curating the selection and putting together a theme. And then my favorite part is I try to include a little handwritten encouragement to every single person every single month. And I get photos all the time of where people keep the little encouragements, like on their mirror or by their bed. And and that part for people is almost as important as the cards themselves, which kind of goes to that same thing of, you know, when, when you're working with real people and spending your dollars with a small business in someone you can really connect with, it's a totally different feeling than, um, you know, going to, going to a big box store. Yeah. No, I love it. And, you know, I'm like a total card nerd because I'm one of those people when I'm in, cause I love going to like the different boutiques in the DC area. Mm-hmm. And then I'll just like see a card. And even if I don't know who to give it to, but I'm like, ah, oh, this card is amazing. I just like collect cards. So then when yes. I'm in the mood, <laughs> like, 
is I like do the same. a problem. And my husband is always like, you own a greeting card company. We just did inventory. We have over 50,000 cards. Like I own 50,000 cards. Why do I still buy other people's cards? But I do it because there will always be that moment where I'm like, oh, I, I don't have exactly the right words or the exactly the right card. And someone really right. needs some love. So I, I do the same. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. And then just before we wrap up, just for those folks out there who are like, oh my God, I wish I had like a greeting card business, you know, or even like, you know, just my own letter press, press and what have you. My question for you is, you know, since you own your own letter press, I'm assuming that you and your team are creating all of these cards. So yes. how do you... How do you keep up with that? Because I even, you know, remember when I was selling light switch plates and I'm even debating now, like if I should start selling them again, but I'm like, oh my God, but if the sales really increase and get crazy, (laughs) I've got to make like, right, all of the the things. So yeah, my question it's funny is how like, as yeah. people, we often are more afraid of success than failure because <laughs> right. I'm the exact same way. There's certain opportunities I've had where I'm like, oh no, this is too much. How am I going, how am I going to do this? Right. And even though I always tell people, it's like, well, let that happen. And then you'll like figure it out. But it's like <laughs> yeah. the fear, like, it's like, oh, sure. how am I going to be able to handle it? But yeah, for you, as like your order started to increase, right? Like, how did you figure out how to stay afloat? Yeah. Um, some of it has been leaps of faith and some of it has been incremental, incremental growth and it's a little bit of both. And that's the thing I probably have learned more than anything else in my business is that you have to plan ahead, but then you also have to be ready to scrap those plans and do something else. And that's, that's, that's been consistent is I'm not going to be able to guess where we're headed all the time. And I have to be okay with my plans shifting. Mm -hmm. And I've just been really lucky with my team to be able to find great people all along the way. Um, but it's, it scares me and it, it still scares me at times delegating. And like right now I'm not personally doing any letterpress printing. I have a, a team member that's doing all of it mm-hmm. and handing all of that off for the first time was terrifying for me. Yeah. So it was a big part of the business, the actual creating of the product. But I, have been able to basically hire someone who's where I was 10 years ago and invest in her and, and help her get the skills she needs and help her grow her own life. And where I didn't have anybody who could pay me to print. Now (laughs) I get to offer that to someone else. And so for me, it helps, (laughs) it helps to see that, that the end, the end goal and the end product of growing is, bringing other people along for the ride and that connection that I get to have with my team and, um, to include them in the family is, is really big for me because I'm not money motivated. I've realized it's like when you're trying to train a dog, you have to figure out what the dogs are motivated by. Like are they food motivated or praise? Like I'm not money motivated. That is just not my thing, but I love to see other people's lives enriched. And I love that that impact and the connection. And if I can keep that going while also actually making money so that the business can keep growing and keep touching other people, then that's, that's success for me. Yeah. Because it's like, it gives you back more time to spend with your family, yeah. right? And more freedom. Absolutely. Um, and then for your team, like how big is your team? Is it like two to three people or have you built it up to like five or six people? We're not quite that large. Um, there's right now there's three of us that do most of the the task throughout the week. And then we have a rotating couple of people who work our brick and mortar shop on the weekends. Cause that's its own, it, having a brick and mortar shop is basically its own full-time job for me. And right now I can fully say I'm working far too many full-time jobs. So I'm working <laughs> on some, some things in this coming year, but, um, so I, I guess there are about six of us, um, on staff. Um, and except for me, everyone is part-time, um, I've, I've just been really lucky with, with the team and I'm just excited to see where we're headed next. No, it's great. And you know, one other question I always get from people, like even, um, I also, uh, used to have like a fashion truck podcast that was like really popular, um, that I did with a friend and you know, what they would always struggle with is to do mobile or a brick and mortar. And some went back and forth. Some started out with a mobile, then went to brick and mortar and vice versa. 
-hmm. For you, you know, with a brick and mortar, right? Like it has to be open, you know, certain days and certain times and, you know, in order to generate money. Um, For you, like, what made you say like, okay, I'm okay with having like a stationary place that I know has to be open, you know, X amount of hours throughout the year. Cause that's like a, it's a commitment, right? It really <laughs> it's a commitment is. to like paying the lease to mm-hmm. making sure you or somebody else is like manning the store. Um, but yeah, what, what kind of prompted you to do that? For, for me, I think a lot of it came from needing a place to put giant machinery. <laughs> I've always, ah. um, until this last summer, we have always rented our home. And so you can't really bring large machinery <laughs> to an apartment or <laughs> something else. Um, so we've always had to have some kind of studio space. And when we were getting ready to start our family, um, I had been commuting to to downtown from where we were living and I got really tired of driving that far. (laughs) So we ended up finding a brick and mortar space that could fit the printing presses and the fulfillment and everything and also was street facing. So it just felt like the right time to do it. Um, But I will say I've had to look a lot at myself in the last few years and realize what my personality really is, how I work, how I like to work and how, um, how things work for me. Because as an introvert, I've recognized that brick and mortar shop life is really hard. It's yeah. really hard because <laughs> I'll go to work and be in a great mood. I'll be sitting there doing my stuff and I, I won't even be downstairs. We have a little loft. So I'll be like hidden away upstairs, <laughs> but then, you know, getting through an email, doing everything, feeling great. And then someone will make a comment about either the cost of something or how it's made or what it says and some kind of criticism, which is you're always going to have criticism Mm -hmm. as a business always. But when it's in your workspace all week long and there's nowhere to go to get away from it, it's it's hard for me as the, you know, as the owner, as the, as the decision maker, it's painful. And, um, yeah, just that, that anchor of open hours and, um, you know, I split my time. I'm home with my son two days a week, and then I try to be in the shop two days a week, and then have one day at home by myself. And so I, I've found a rhythm that works. But it's it took me a long time to realize that I I'm not efficient. I don't get things done, and I don't walk away being excited about my day nearly as much when I'm in the shop as when I'm not in the shop. And I couldn't have told you that six years ago when we opened, but mm. now I really know how I work best. And, um, you know, all of it's, all of it's a learning experience, but I, I have now without saying too much, I have realized that for me being mobile and flexible and getting to set my own schedule and shift things as needed is something I value a whole Mm -hmm. lot. Mm -hmm. So shifts, shifts may be coming. Yeah. (laughs) It's hard. It's hard as a business owner to, you know, to make a, a long-term decision and then recognize that you want to make a different decision um, for the next 10 years or whatever it is. But yeah, but things shift, feel- right? As we like yeah. grow and go into different chapters Absolutely. of our lives. Absolutely. Like my son, my, my son was, hadn't even been born yet when we opened the brick and mortar and now he's starting kindergarten. And I look at him and I can wow. recognize how much time <laughs> has passed, but it's hard, you know, it's hard to give yourself credit for how much you've grown over the last five years. Yeah. Yeah. Well, folks, I will definitely include the address in the um, show notes, but uh, you know, I'm not in Seattle. I'm in the DC area, but I have been marked on on Google to go. If I'm ever in <laughs> Seattle, I have the, the little flag. Want to go? I love it. I love it. <laughs> so, so, people, if you're in Seattle, definitely check her out. Um, well, I just have like a few wrap up questions for you. Great. The first one is: How do you stay organized? Any tools, software, techniques, anything um, that helps you like keep the keep stuff going? Yeah, I lean on the Google Suite, the business apps, a ton um, for like calendaring. My husband and I have shared calendars, and I have shared calendars with my team, so everything goes into the digital calendar so that I can look at it at a glance because I have just too many things going on. <laughs> <laughs> for a paper calendar. Um, I also use the app Todoist, which I really, really mm. like um, for for making lists because I can 
make a big list for a project, but I can also schedule things for days. So I'll start at the beginning of the week and set out all the things I want to do. And if I can't get it done on Monday, then I can shift it to Thursday or whatever else. So I, um, I do quite a bit with that. Um, and then, you know, Google Drive for all of those, you know, wor- worksheets and documents. And I just try to keep everything in the cloud so that I can access it from work or from home or from my phone or from wherever I am. And I wrote almost my entire book in, in a Google doc for that reason. Mm, yeah. <laughs> so if I wanted to work on it in the car while my son, you know, fell asleep in the back seat or, you know, while I was waiting for someone or any of that, I wanted to have access to it at all times. Love it. And then do you have a hobby? Oh, I have many hobbies. I'm a person <laughs> who collects hobbies. Um, but currently my big hobby is house plants. I love my plants. I have way yes. too many plants. And <laughs> I just feel like such a proud mom when you know, one of them pops out a new leaf or blooms. And that's that's been good for me. It's very different than what I do in any other aspect of my life. And I get to like have quiet time and calm and tend to my plants. <laughs> now, and, and I'll tell you people, I had a brown thumb where I killed everything. And I am up to like 10 plants now. I've got nice. like two fiddle leaves, which are really funny because yeah, they're hard. They are heard. really hard, but I've got that and a palaya and ZZ plant. So people, yes. when I tell you, once oh, yeah. you figure it out, like yep. it's an addiction, but it's absolutely. a good addiction. Cause it and brings I, I was absolutely the same. I was terrible with plants and I just started to read a lot about them and research them. And I realized that you can't like find a spot in your room where you want a plant and then just put a plant there. Like you need to buy no. a plant. I think it's no way, you know, and, no. and research it and learn about it and then find exactly its perfect spot and exactly how much water it wants. And I have a lot of fun with that kind of shifting things around and finding a place where they'll be happy. <laughs> yeah. Because with that fiddle leaf, I was like, Oh my God, my husband was laughing. Cause he was like, another leaf fell. And I was like, oh, I, no. know. <laughs> I know, but once I found a home, and I didn't move yep. it. It was good, right? Like yep. it's like <laughs> I love it. And right I think there's the so many <laughs> metaphors for ourselves as people that we can get from plants. Like we need water, we need sunlight, we need like a safe place, and we need to just be patient because growth takes a long time. Right. We need to celebrate it when it comes. <laughs> I just think it's a good reminder. Yes. Um, and then please just tell the listeners where to find you, any uh, social media handles, websites, you know, all the things. Absolutely. We are at constellationco.com. You can find us on Instagram and Twitter at Constellation Co. But I also have an Instagram that is snail mail superstar for snail mail inspiration, all that good stuff. And you can find me on YouTube as snail mail superstar as well, doing all kinds of goofy things, but mostly just opening my mail. <laughs> No, I love it. Well, Sarah, thank you. I've enjoyed this conversation. I know it's going to be inspiration to those folks out there that just needed a little, little push. Um, Well, thank (laughs) you. So thanks for coming on to the podcast. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. So much goodness, what I tell you guys. Amazing, right? She's the second Sarah in a row. So, I mean, Sarah's a kind of boss right now. They are doing their thing. Anyway, I hope you guys learned a lot. One, how important it is to just diversify your income. Two, how snail mail can impact the lives of others. For all the links or companies or what have you that we mentioned in that episode, you can go to nishaysnow.com slash 103 for episode episode 103, which is crazy. So that was nishaysnow.com slash 103. And if you love this episode, please leave a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts and leave a little comment. I really appreciate like all the love that you guys have given me over there so far. If you're on YouTube, please leave a comment and thumbs up and Spotify. I don't know what you can do on Spotify, but if you can rate me, please rate me on Spotify too. Anywho, uh, and don't forget as you're quarantined at home, learn some stuff on Skillshare, including taking my course on how to organize your life to make time for your passion. Get two months free by going over to nishaysnow.com slash Skillshare. All right, folks, stay safe and I will catch you guys next week with 
another amazing guest. All right. Take care. Bye.